GLM 4.7 just dropped, and it's a huge win for open source. The model is now hitting numbers we used to associate with closed systems, especially in agent coding and tool-heavy workflows. And at the same time, Manus rolled out a design update that finally fixes one of the most annoying problems in AI images, making real edits without starting over. China's been shipping some serious AI updates lately, so let's talk about it. All right, so GLM 4.7 is the latest model in Jipu's GLM line, and it's being pushed as a coding-first, agent-friendly system. That framing matters. This isn't a model optimized to look clever in a short chat exchange. It's aimed at longer runs where a model has to plan, execute, call tools, and stay consistent across many steps. Honestly, that's where most models start to show cracks. It's rarely about not knowing how to write the code. The real problem is that over time, the model loses the thread, forgets earlier changes, starts contradicting itself, and the whole workflow slowly unravels. What's interesting here is that GLM 4.7 isn't just a mild improvement over 4.6. The jumps show up across coding benchmarks, agent benchmarks, and reasoning with tools benchmarks, which is exactly the combination you'd want if you're using coding agents like Claude Code, Klein, Rue Code, Kilo Code, or Tray style setups. And yeah, the model is being positioned as compatible with those workflows, including a think before act style that makes agent execution more stable. So let's talk about coding performance first, because this is where the numbers are hard to ignore. On SWE Bench Verified, GLM 4.7 hits 73.8%. For an open model, that's a serious milestone. A model has to read a problem, understand a code base it didn't train on, locate the right area, apply changes that match project structure, and produce something that passes. So when a model performs well here, it usually means it's tracking the task properly. On Live Code Bench version 6, GLM 4.7 comes in at 84.9%. And the reason people care about Live Code Bench is that it's closer to the kind of coding you actually do in the wild. It's not just write a function, it's handling constraints, edge cases, and correct reasoning around what the code should do. The multilingual angle is also important. SWE Bench multilingual moves to 66.7%, which is a big jump compared to GLM 4.6. Now, terminal workflows. This is where models often feel the least reliable because terminal tasks demand correct sequencing and state awareness. On Terminal Bench 2.0, GLM 4.7 reaches 41%, up massively from the previous version. There's also a hard terminal benchmark where GLM 4.7 sits in the low 30s, and the exact number matters less than the fact that the jump is large and consistent across the terminal suite. That usually means fewer broken command chains and better ability to recover when something doesn't work. Here's the thing, when people say this model is good for agents, they don't mean it answered a question nicely. They mean it can handle multi-step work without turning into a mess. Terminal tasks are basically a stress test for that. The model has to decide what to do next, run the right command, interpret the output, and then adapt. That's very different from responding to a prompt. GLM 4.7 improving here points to better control and better internal planning. Reasoning is another area where the model moved forward, especially when tools are involved. On Humanity's last exam with tools enabled, GLM 4.7 hits 42.8%. Without tools, it's much lower, which is normal. The key point is that with tools, the model makes a major jump compared to the previous generation. That tells you something important about how it's meant to operate. It's designed to reason with external capability, like browsing, context management, and interactive tool calls, rather than pretending everything is already in the model weights. You also see gains in other reasoning-heavy benchmarks, including MML UPro, GPQA Diamond, and a stack of math and competition-style evaluations. The exact rankings vary depending on the benchmark, but the pattern is consistent. The model is more capable, and the biggest leaps show up when you evaluate it as part of a tool using system instead of a standalone chat model. Now, the how matters, not just the scores. GLM 4.7 introduces three thinking modes that are clearly designed for agent stability. Interleaved thinking means the model reasons before every response or tool call. Preserved thinking means the reasoning can persist across multiple turns rather than being regenerated every time. Turn-level thinking control means you can dial it down for simple tasks and dial it up for complex ones. Honestly, preserved thinking is the one that changes the feel of long sessions. A lot of models, even strong ones, start to lose coherence over time because their reasoning resets. 
they re-derive decisions from scratch and tiny differences accumulate. Then you get drift. Preserved thinking reduces that drift because the model can carry forward its internal reasoning state across turns. That tends to make long horizon tasks less fragile, and it also saves cost because you're not paying for the model to rethink the same plan over and over. And this is where you start to see why GLM 4.7 is being talked about as a serious coding agent backend model. It's not just that it can code, it's that it's more stable when it's running inside an agent framework that breaks tasks into steps. There's also a tool use angle that's pretty strong. On BrowseComp, which is a web task benchmark, GLM 4.7 hits the low 50s in the base setting and then jumps to 67.5 when context management is used. That's a key detail because context management is exactly what web browsing and tool orchestration need. On Tau Squared Bench, which focuses on interactive tool use, it hits 87.4. That places it right up there with top systems and practical tool interaction. Now, let's talk about real-world developer signals. Because benchmarks are one thing, but adoption and integration patterns tell you what people actually do with a model. GLM 4.7 is integrated into Z.AI with an API platform that supports standard and streaming usage. It's also available through OpenRouter, which matters for global access and quick integration into existing stacks. And it's being advertised as compatible with common coding agents, which means you can swap it into the same workflows people already use. There's also mention of performance on specific hardware setups, including very high token throughput for earlier GLM versions on specialized inference providers. The point isn't the exact tokens per second figure, the point is that the ecosystem around the model is clearly thinking about practical deployment, not just research releases. One more detail that gets overlooked is the model's improvements in front-end output and vibe coding, basically UI generation quality. The model is claimed to produce cleaner web pages, better layout balance, more coherent styling, and better slide generation. There's a specific metric around 16 by 9 slide layout accuracy improving dramatically which is the kind of boring sounding detail that actually matters if you've ever tried to generate slides and then fix them. If the default output is closer to usable, you spend less time fighting it. Now, limitations. Even with these gains, a top proprietary model can still outperform GLM 4.7 on certain hard tasks, especially in zero-shot scenarios where you want a perfect solution instantly. And for local deployment, the full precision model is heavy, you're talking about a deployment that requires serious hardware and even quantized variants still need a competent setup. So it's not a casual install and go for everyone. But here's the more practical framing. A lot of teams don't need the absolute best model on earth. They need a model that's strong, stable, affordable, and controllable. Open weights matter for compliance, customization, and long-term cost. And on the cost side, GLM 4.7 is positioned as significantly cheaper than premium proprietary alternatives with larger usage quotas. That changes who can afford to run agent workflows at scale. All right, that's GLM 4.7. Now let's switch to Manus because this is a completely different category of update, but it hits a very real pain point that basically everyone doing AI visuals has run into. So Manus launched Design View, and the best way to understand it is this. It's trying to turn AI image generation into an actual editable workflow instead of a lottery machine. The typical AI image loop is painful. You prompt, you get an image that's close, then you notice one thing is wrong. The lamp color is off, the text is garbled, the sofa shape is weird, the logo placement is wrong. You wanna change one detail, but the only tool you have is regeneration. So you prompt again, and now the whole image changes. Lighting shifts, composition changes, the vibe changes, and you're stuck trying to recover the version you liked. Design View attacks that problem directly. You generate an image, and then you edit it on a canvas using precise selection tools. Manus calls it a mark tool. Essentially, you highlight the region you want to change, and you apply a local edit while the system tries to preserve the rest of the image's characteristics. That one idea sounds small, but honestly, it's the difference between AI as a generator and AI as a usable design tool. The workflow Manus is pushing is generate first, then refine, not regenerate, refine. Now, Manus is powering this with Google's Nano Banana Pro for photorealistic interior design generation and related edits. And Nano Banana Pro is generally positioned as a high fidelity image model, the kind that can follow prompts closely and produce clean, realistic outputs. 
The key part is that Manus isn't just using it to create images, it's using it to preserve consistency during edits. That's hard, because local edits tend to break coherence if the model doesn't handle context properly. For example, if you change an object color in a room, a naive edit would also change lighting or reflections or textures in a way that feels disconnected from the rest of the scene. Menace is trying to keep those elements aligned so the image doesn't look patched together. That's what preserving original image characteristics really means in practice. It's about maintaining the look of the original shot while still allowing targeted changes. Another thing Manus highlights is text editing. AI image generation is notoriously bad at embedded text. It's one of the most common failure points. Manus addresses this by allowing clean, editable text overlays on the canvas, which is a more practical approach than forcing the image model to perfectly render typography. That's a smart design choice, because in real workflows, you want editable text anyway. Now, the second big part of the Manus update is slide editing, specifically for slides generated in image generation mode using Nano Banana Pro. And this is a big deal, because AI slide generation has had a nasty usability problem for a while. A lot of tools generate slides as images. They look nice, but they're not editable. Then you spot a typo, or you want to adjust spacing, and your only option is to regenerate the entire slide. That's absurd in a real presentation workflow. Manus says those slides are now editable at the element level. That means you can change text, point, and edit visual elements, compare before and after, and even run bulk edits across multiple selected areas. Bulk edits matter a lot because presentations often require consistent changes across multiple slides, like updating a product name, swapping a color, changing a tagline, or fixing formatting issues. What's interesting here is that Manus is basically restoring the missing last mile control. AI tools are good at generating drafts quickly. The last mile is where people spend time making the output correct, consistent, and presentation ready. Element level editing is exactly that. It doesn't just make the tool nicer, it makes it usable. Manus also positions Design View as more than just an image editor. It's an interactive canvas where you can generate visuals, refine them, and keep everything in one workspace instead of bouncing between apps. That's the core pitch. Fewer exports, fewer tool switches, fewer prompt resets. They also mention multimodal generation, including images, videos, and 3D assets on the canvas, though the clearest demonstrated value right now is photoreal visuals and editing. And the design update is available across web and mobile, which is actually meaningful for teams. A lot of tools claim mobile access, but only for viewing. Manus is pushing actual edits across devices, which makes it easier to do quick revisions without being tied to one machine. There's also a note about performance and speed. Typical image generation is described as taking around 10 to 30 seconds with longer times for more complex, research-integrated layouts. That's pretty normal for high-quality image generation. The main improvement here isn't raw speed, it's iteration speed. If you can fix a detail without regenerating, you save minutes and sometimes hours across a project. Manus also makes a clear statement about ownership and usage rights. Basically, that users retain ownership of what they create and can use it for personal or commercial work. For professional adoption, clarity here matters. Teams don't want vague licensing. Now, how does Manus compare to other options people already know, like Photoshop's Generative Fill, Canva's Magic Edit, or built-in AI tools and design platforms? The main difference is workflow integration. Photoshop is incredibly powerful, but it's still Photoshop. It's a separate environment, and it's not structured as an AI agent workflow. Canva is accessible and fast, but access can depend on plan tier, and the editing logic is different. Manus is trying to be an all-in-one flow where you generate, edit, and manage assets in the same agent-like environment that also handles research and context. Whether Manus wins long-term depends on how reliable those edits are at scale. The promise is strong, local edits, preserved layout, editable text overlays, and bulk changes for slides. The real test is consistency across batches, especially when you need brand alignment. But even without promising perfection, the direction is clear. Manus is moving away from prompt roulette and toward an editor-first loop. All right, that's everything for today. If you enjoyed this breakdown, hit like, subscribe for more updates like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.